welcome to the studio today. We're going to be working on loading Trick or Treat onto the quilting frame today. This is a laser cut and prefused applique uh, kit. It could also be purchased as uh, patterns, but um, I made this before I actually started doing videos, so this was all um, on my own background fabric. <laughs> Rather than piecing the blocks after I put the applique together, I went ahead and just used one solid background and used the spacing that would have been uh, built into the pattern itself. So this is my trick-or-treat. Um, the fabric that you see in the applique is what was actually in the applique kit. And so I already have that fused in place. Today we're going to put it on the quilting machine. I'm going to be utilizing the IQ and I have my tablet off of the frame today. I'm going to uh, go put, uh, pick a, a design for the trick-or-treat. I have one or two of them in mind. I think I want something with a spiderweb feel because this is a Halloween uh, quilt. And then I'm going to go ahead and go through the process with you about how to uh, log into your account on Urban Elements, how to download the design, how to take the file that you've downloaded, unzip it, transfer it to a USB stick, and then I'll bring this USB stick back out and we'll load it into the tablet. Uh, which I will have to put onto the machine uh, at some point. And then we'll get uh, to loading the quilt top. I already have backing and batting on the frame. And we'll start getting this process going. So stay with me and we'll get right to it. This is essentially the pattern of applique for the quilt that I want to find a quilting pattern for today. So you can keep that in mind. We have a little bat, a uh, witch with her hat and shoes, our pumpkin, a crazy cat, some stacked pumpkins, and our little mascot bird. So that is what I'm going to be trying to find a, a quilting pattern for. And um, I can punch in Trick or Treat, which is the name of this applique set and we'll be able to see that there's a variety of Halloween type uh, patterns that are available. And this is just part of my thought process on choosing a pattern. Okay, we have a cat. These are some individual motifs and I could just uh, repeat these over and over. So we have a, a screechy cat, we have the bat, then we have the trick-or-treat motif, which is, as you can see, a cat, a witch's hat, a broom, a bat. So I know there's another set of patterns. Along came a spider. Here we have a series of uh, that particular quilting design. We have it in a regular size and in a petite. We have a sashing, which would be much smaller. As I'm looking at this, um, I'm not really crazy about the spider part of it. Um, it might be a little hard uh, with that. And so I'm going to just look up spider web because I do like the spider web portion of that. And these again are some really beautiful patterns um, to choose from. Um, these at the top are all available individually. These would be really pretty if you were doing in alternating blocks um, using these spider webs as motifs. They're really quite stunning. And those would be beautiful, I think, stitched out in silver. Uh, again, we have a spider, with, a spider web with spider. This would be another great block. Spider web here is cute with the different size spider webs. But ultimately, I think I like spindle. I like the way that it interlocks. And um, you can see how it jumbles up and down. So that really hides the interlocking of the different rows. And you can see this was available as a paper pattern and it would have been uh, 10 and 3 quarters inches high. 
says here 10 and 10.75. We could get it as a digital pattern, which is what I will be doing. We could purchase it as a self print, which would mean we would be utilizing our home printer. And it's available as a tearaway. And the tearaway does have instructions for how that works. Uh, tearaway is a single use product. So you'd have to buy that in the equivalent packages to fulfill your quilt size. So spindle is what we chose, it's what I chose, and we'll get on with the process of downloading that and onto the quilt. As I said, I have the IQ off of the uh, machine, and what we're going to do is now load the design that I've chosen uh, today, and so I'm going to hit load synchronize, and nothing's happening okay then we'll hit uh, load and you'll see that there's an error right here indicating that I'm supposed to put the USB stick in the USB port and you can see that there there and it says it's waiting for USB drive it's copying the patterns that I have on the USB stick and you can see there's three that I have on there uh, and um, it says the file transfer is complete so at this point I can go ahead and remove the uh, USB stick and hit the back button and now this particular design is already loaded in the machine it's going to be in a file called downloads but I'm going to go ahead and put the IQ tablet back on the uh, head of the machine so it syncs with the motors and we'll go ahead and show you where the design is at in the software and how I can uh, move it from the library into its regular uh, design collection from Urban Elements and then I'll show you how I load it onto the uh, makeup of the quilt so that we can get it stitched. Connecting the IQ back to the table bracket is easy. I just have to line up the USB port with this USB stick that's built into the tablet base itself. And now that that's uh, down in place, I go ahead and lock this clamp. This clamp just keeps it firmly connected to the bracket itself so it doesn't lose connection with the sensors of the motor. So now I can go ahead through the regular process of selecting Design Sew Quilt to put in the parameters of the quilt and start choosing my design. We are at the main menu for Design Sew Quilt and I'm going to go ahead and start getting the uh, design loaded. Uh, so I can hit, well let's see first. If I hit Utilities and Library Maintenance we could uh, do something there. We could go to the pattern library and it says what type of pi uh, pattern maintenance do I want to do and I want to move something. So I'm going to go down to my downloads and you can see these are the three things that I have just recently downloaded. Two of them I've already used but I'm going to do the spindle today and I want to select, I've selected it and uh, it's highlighted. Now I'm going to move it and do I want to leave a copy in this pattern catalog? Yeah, that's fine. And then I enter the name of the pattern, which it's uh, already on here, but I'll go ahead and do that again. Well, actually I don't have to, it's done. So I just go ahead and hit enter and it's going to ask me where I want to send it. So what I want to do is send it to the Urban Elements file on the IQ and I'll select that and so now when I go to Urban Elements under S because the name of the pattern was Spindle we can find it right here it's alphabetically located in my index of Urban Elements Patterns, it says Spindle 10.75, which lets me know the height of this particular pattern as it was as a paper pantograph, which is very helpful when I'm sizing it for the quilt, so I have a, at least a reference point. So um, I can go back to the main menu now because I'm finished with uh, 
the moving of the design. So I can start over, design sew quilt, and I'm going to start new. I want to uh, replace any work that I have in progress, erase, and I'm also going to uh, start fresh with my time clock. I'm going to choose a pantograph and I'm going to enter the rectangle manually. Now the actual quilt top that I'm going to put on is 48 inches wide, but I'm not going to input 48 inches because I want the design to stitch off. I want it to start off and stitch off of the edges. The reason I do that is because where the uh, design will end, it's just going to sew a straight line down the side of the design from one end point to the other. And I don't want those straight lines to stitch onto the quilt by accident because the quilt is shifted or it isn't uh, measured perfectly. So I want those to sew off of the edge and then I can just trim it. So where my original size was 48 inches, I'm actually going to enter 54. So I've added uh, quite a few inches onto both sides. But I've made sure that I haven't made that measurement longer than my batting or my backing. It will still stitch on the side of the batting and the backing without going off of the quilt itself. So I did make sure to do that. And the same for the length. The length of the top is 56, but I'm going to say 64 inches and enter. Once I continue, you can see there's a rectangle on the top of the screen that represents the size of the quilt I've selected. So now I'm going to say finished. Now it's a matter of bringing in the design. And again, I'm going to go back to S for the alphabetical. And I'm just going to arrow through my alphabet until I find spindle. I also could just punch in spindle in the search engine and it would take me right to uh, the design. I'm, I've selected it for the even rows. Now I'm going to do the same for the odd rows. And now you can see that the design has one, two, three, four, five and a half rows that would stitch out for this whole quilt as it comes up, but it leaves a lot of blank space in there. Um, and I could leave it like that if I wanted because with today's batting, it doesn't have to be quilted. You know, you have anywhere from four to five to eight or nine inches in between the quilting design. So I, you don't have to quilt that heavily, but I'm going to go ahead and eliminate the gap and I can use the arrows to do that or I could just use my finger. And you can see once I touch the design and start sliding it, it starts to interlock the pattern. And I can get that to a point that's pleasing to me that will be different for everybody on the planet. But I kind of like it as it is here, so I'm going to hit uh, row height now. And I'm going to take this design back to the original size that it was as a paper pantograph. 10.75. I've used that information from the website and from the PDF file that came with the download. Now I don't have to do that, but that's just what I'm choosing to do. And I'll hit enter. And now you can see that I have the design as it would sew out. So let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six and a half. So it's increased an additional row by keeping it at its original size, but I'm happy with that. I don't want the design to be so big that it makes uh, the sizing of the applique look funny. So I hit finished, and now I'm gonna start with my transition and how it's going to uh, do the whole quilt together, which is what I want. I don't want to have to sew this row by row and refigure it each time. So I hit transition type accept and I commit to that. And I'm going to hit sew quilt. And um, then I'm going to start hitting the uh, very top design, which is a partial continue panto sequencing. 
I'm going to uh, sew left to right. Actually, I'm going to go back. I'm going to go back and do it uh, right to left. Now alternate. I'm going to alternate which side it starts off so that when I finish on the left, it'll start on the left. And when I finish on the right, it will start on the right. So I'm going to go back and do that. Okay, I'm back to where I was. I have my uh, pantograph selected. I've decreased the gap. I've changed the sizing to 10.75. And I'm going to commit to my continuous uh, transition. Now, uh, I'm going to select Pantro Sequencing Assistant. And I'll start up here at the top. Continue. This time I'm going to select alternate because it's I could select left to right sewing each time or right to left but it just saves a little bit of time if I sew right to left and then I start there and sew left to right because the machine can do both. So I'll select that. I'm going to tie off in between and I'm going to select the whole quilt and you can see it did the whole quilt at once. There's only one jump line and that's for the very last row because it doesn't start all the way at the edge. So I'm going to go ahead and select Sew Quilt and it's asking me to make sure that <coughs> the uh, stitch regulator is on, on manual and then I can go ahead and start sewing. But I still have to get the top on here so I'm going to do that first. I have the quilt top basted on uh, the top and the two sides as far as I can go for this section of the quilt. And um, I did that with the thread that was left on there from last time, which was a, a variegated rainbow thread. Um, I mean, this has got a lot of colors. I could have just kept rainbow in there, but um, I don't want the rainbow on this particular quilt because I don't think it really matches what I'm going to be sewing, which is a spider web. Now, <clears throat> if I thought I was going to have really good luck with metallic thread, I might actually have stitched out the uh, entire pattern with the silver metallic, which might have been very nice. I'll never know. Um, sometimes I have a trouble keeping metallic thread from breaking. So then my other option would have been like a, some shade of gray that I could have uh, quilted on here. But there's so much color in here, um, I don't think I would want gray or white. I just don't think it would have added anything to the party. So what I think of as uh, neutral, but in the color family, is shades of purple or lavender. And so I happen to have this variegated purple thread. It's Isocord 40 weight. And you can see that um, sometimes the thread is going to uh, show up really clearly and sometimes it's going to fade away. And I like the idea of that because that's in a way what spider webs do. They um, are sometimes visible and sometimes invisible. That's how we end up walking right through them and get them all over our eyelashes. So that's how I came to choose this. I might have chose one that was more lavender if I had a variegated that was more lavender, but this is the only version of purple I have. So I'm going to go ahead and get this loaded. And since I haven't ever shown the loading of thread with the addition of the IQ, I'm going to go ahead and do that today. Whenever I'm going to change the thread on the machine, I never pull thread back out in the reverse direction of the uh, tension disc on the machine. So I always clip the thread at the top and then I'll just grab the thread down here at the bottom. I've raised the tension, the uh, presser foot up, which is also opening up the tension clamps, uh, making it ready for the new thread to load. So now I'm going to go ahead and zoom in just a little bit and show you how I thread the additional uh, uptake here and the thread sensor. I have my new spool of isocord on the spool holder and I am using the vertical spool holder not the horizontal and I'm just going to go ahead and loop that over the um, thread stand and I'm going to I have a short piece here I don't have two miles long a thread I'm going to take it through the first loop 
and then back around through the second loop and that's all that I do and I make sure that it's not uh, knotted over anywhere and then I'm going to go around this wheel twice that is the thread sensor and that will alert the <coughs> IQ system to stop if the thread stops feeding through either the thread is broken at the top or the bobbins empty and it's no longer feeding so either way this sensor will stop the machine and then from here it's just a matter of threading the uh, machine as usual I looped it here over the uh, lubrication pad and here now as I go through the rest of the machine I always hold one end of the thread just so I have a uh, good grip on it and if I don't do that it doesn't seem to get caught in the tension disc in here so I always make sure I hold the end of it and you don't really have to open this door to feed it through the rest of the machine but sometimes I do I went ahead and got my kinks out of the way and I sewed uh, the very very top portion which was just actually a couple of little stitches on the top of the quilt it was just a fill in space I'm going to go ahead and start the machine now that I've got it now that I've got it situated uh, we're going to go ahead and sew this time from the right to the left. Uh, then it will start back again on left to right, but I'll have to roll the quilt at that point. We are going to be uh, stitching right now on the border. I'm kind of anxious to see how the spindle pattern looks on the grunge fabric, the background fabric. Uh, but so far I like the way it looks. The stitch length looks good and the tension. I always reduce the tension just a little bit. It's, uh, I went from 4.0 to 3.5 for the isocord. It just seems to stitch out better. So I'm going to go ahead and let this play out just a little bit and I'll zoom in and let you get a closer look. I'm just going to show a few seconds here at this point because it's stitching on this uh, brightly colored background and the stitching isn't showing up a whole lot. I think we'll get a better view of the pattern when we get to the background. So I'll just go ahead and uh, pause until we get to that point and then I'll bring you back in. Because I've selected 10 and 3 quarter inch to stitch out this design, I'm stitching it out exactly the same size as it would have stitched out if I were using a paper pantograph or if I were using the tearaway uh, quilting pattern for this design because that is the uh, way that it was meant to be stitched out. Uh, as we're stitching on the background here, you can see a little bit better the way that the variegated thread moves in and out of uh, lightness so that there are varying degrees of contrast between the background and the thread itself. And the spiderweb spindle is moving its way all the way across the quilt. We'll get a nice even spacing on here without it being too heavily quilted. And I don't think the thread detracts too much from the applique itself. We'll get a better representation of that once the design is fully stitched out and we can see it uh, flat. But so far I like the way the design is looking. You can see that there's nice uh, texture and dimension from the quilting. And that could have been amplified if I had chosen to use an additional layer of batting. I just have a thin layer of cotton, but I could have added a layer of wool on top that would have made this particular quilting design pop a little bit more with the dimensionality of that wool batting. What I've done is I got the uh, quilt off of the frame. This is the trick or treat with the spindle quilting pattern and uh, I've taken it upstairs and I've trimmed off the uh, edges and gotten it cleaned up. I also attached a little pocket to the back. That's going to be the sleeve once the binding gets attached. And speaking of binding, I just made a whole pile of black binding. 
uh, certainly enough for this quilt and probably two more. Making binding isn't my favorite part of the quilting process, neither is the machine attaching or the hand applique portion of it. Um, and having said that, I like even worse looking at the double machined binding. That's just a personal preference. But I've made enough binding today so that the next two times I need black binding, I won't have to make it again. So I'm going to go ahead and machine this on. But essentially, um, I'm done holding you up for today. I just wanted to show you what the finished result was for the spindle quilting. Uh, probably will give you a little bit of a close-up as we're doing our closing uh, so you can see it a little closer but for me that's it for today and hopefully you'll see this hanging in the studio sometime soon we needed a little representation of the Halloween holiday because we have a lot of uh, Christmas so we'll get this hung up as soon as I get the binding on and we'll look forward to seeing you again next time